Words at War. I reject you. Oh, yes, with you I will have nothing to do. Until you come to me, until I welcome you over the slain bodies of the invaders, of my enemies. Death? Do you hear me? China and I reject you. That is the young voice of China, the voice I heard in the cities, in the villages, along the river banks, in the malarial swamps, in the hills where the guerrilla fighters hide and strike from. That is the voice I heard for the 12 years I lived in China. Words at War. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, brings you another in its series of radio adaptations of important war books. Tonight, the story of a woman who has lived and worked with the guerrilla armies of China. The Battle Hymn of China by Agnes Smedley. If you listen to my voice, it is only because I can tell you something, some little something about your ally in this war, the people of China. First, in a hospital. Not the spick and span and sanitary hospital you know. No, more like a hovel. The straw pallets on the floor are crammed close together. There are more than enough wounded to fill them. The people in this village behind the battle lines and the streets outside are noisy. Carts pushing their way through the jammed streets. Some of the carts bringing in more wounded. And the constant tramp of other soldiers going up to meet the enemy. In this place called a hospital, I saw one wounded soldier crouching beside the straw pallet of another wounded man. I went up to them. I spoke to the crouching soldier. This is your friend, soldier? Yes, you should be on your own cot. You're wounded. They'll put someone else in your place. He is worse off than I am. He carried me. What is his name? He will tell you. But he doesn't open his eyes. He's looking at you now. Yes. His eyes are very brown. His name is Wu. Where does Wu come from? Far away from here. In a small, worm-eaten village. He was a farmer. We attacked a Japanese garrison this morning. Yes, I know. We killed them and killed them and killed them until they brought up more troops. Then we retreated. We didn't know. I didn't know we were wounded. Well, you must have known. Must have. We didn't. We just found out we couldn't walk. The spikes of bamboo the Japanese had driven into the earth about their defenses pierced our feet. Your naked, shoeless feet. We could not walk on our bleeding feet. But Wu thought he could walk better than I. He carried me. The blood he had so little of seeping out of him. Look, he's opened his eyes again. My name... Is Wu. See how thin he is. No food. He cannot resist death. But he carried me on his bleeding feet. Soldier. My friend. Yes? Wu is dead. 
Yes, I know. I saw him shut his eyes. Forever. You must lie down, too. You should sleep. Wu is beyond help now. I shall sit here. I cannot sleep anyway. I shall sit here. Till they put my friend Wu in an unpainted wooden box. Hammer down the lid. And they will lower the wooden box into a small hole in the hillside. The dirt will fall on the box until it is covered over. A board will be put over his grave, saying on it the date of his death, the army he served with, and his name. Wu. Then the windy rains will come, blowing over him, soaking into his grave. At last, the grass will grow over it, and he will be forgotten. The one whose name is Wu. Then at last some child, some farmer's kid will come looking for wood to make a fire. He will find the board over Wu's grave. He will break it for kindling. For kindling. Death, I reject you. Oh, yes, with you I will have nothing to do. Until you come to me, until I welcome you over the slain bodies of the invaders, of my enemies. Death, do you hear me? China and I reject you. Don't you how it came about after 12 years that my life became to me like a something you pack in a bundle and carry with you, but you're not surprised if you lose it? No, not in China, beset with invaders, ruthless, tenacious. I think you understand. In the fall of 1939, I was given permission to go into the region north of the Yangtze River, into guerrilla country along with a company of military teachers, and the first medical unit to aid the guerrillas, a few nurses and a doctor. We would have to cross through enemy-held territory, about a hundred of us. I had my little life in a bundle, packed and ready. Silence! Silence! Commander Fung Dafi will speak to us. My comrades, the area we are going to cross is a battle zone. Before night, we will be where there is almost continual fighting. We will travel only at night, hide during the day. On the march, there is to be no talking, no smoking or lighted matches, no flashlights. This happens to be the time of the month best for our travel because the moon does not rise till one or two. It will be dark, therefore. You must follow the person ahead of you. If he steps up, you step up. Down, you step down. Some of the way will be treacherous. A few minutes now for final preparations. Then we start. Even our shoes must be of cloth. So we will make no noise on the march, nor wake people sleeping in the villages we will pass through. And I have a special bodyguard, Tsai Lu, a young, tough guerrilla fighter. Soba! Soba! That means forward. It's time, Miss Medley. We're about to march. I'm ready, Tsai. Don't be frightened. I will guard you. Oh, I'm just a little nervous. Soba! Soba! We are underway. <laughs> No spy must be allowed to know we are on the march. What a rich supply of corpses we would make for the Japanese, if any did. No sound must be made. <coughs> be still. Only the soft, padding feet of many men and women. Halt! Halt! They may be firing at us. And as we wait to see if the firing is at us, I see in the darkness the resting shapes of the others. And I think this is their land, and they, the rightful owners, must steal through it like thieves. But 
Alfred is still theirs. Still theirs. Sopa, sopa. We start again, Miss Smedley. We're coming to a village. As the mongrel dogs curse their nasty little throats. Do they give us away? They may wake people up. But no one's stirring, and we'll be through this village in a moment or so. No spy must know of our passage. No spy must know of these hundred people making their way to the Yangtze River, to the land where the guerrillas are fighting. But I'm tired walking all night, carrying my little bundle of life. Who may not snatch it from me in the darkness? Rest, rest. The daylight is about to break. We can rest now, Miss Smedley. And eat a little food. Snatch a little sleep hidden from the eyes of the enemy. Then at night, we're on the march again. And all the sound of gunfire. The battle is never done. It may be Chinese snipers, it may be Japanese. But still, the marching goes on without lights, without talk, as quiet as possible. Tsai, look. There are shadows ahead in that village. As if they were waiting for us. There are people moving. Don't be frightened. They're friends who knew of our coming. The shadows you see are long tables with a little food on them, all they could scrape together, and hot water for you to drink. But do not speak to them. Do not even say thank you. That is an order. Even a whisper. Many whispers make a great voice. Take the food, drink the hot water, and move on. All I can do is press the hand of the Chinese woman whose face I cannot see offering me a cup of hot water. The dog barking. He'll get the rest of them going. The Japanese will know there are strangers in this darkened village. They have silenced it to save us. And perhaps it was that little child I see returning like a ghost in the darkness to where we are eating and drinking in silence before we go on. Marching until daylight again, when we rest. It will be dark soon again, comrades. We will be on the march. We are nearly at the banks of the Yangtze. And we are about to go between two enemy garrisons. There will probably be fighting between them and our guards. Do not stop if you hear fighting. Go on, on till you reach the river. There you will take boats. And remember, once we are crossing the river itself, there will be no retreat. I know some of you are sick from malaria. Some of you have sore feet. We have come many, many miles. But now you must summon all your strength for the supreme effort. Now, comrades, Soba! We're getting there. We can see the moon. The traitor moon is coming up. And in its light, we can see the broad expanse of the young. We can see the boat waiting for us. We are almost there. Almost, almost. Do you hear that sound? It is the creak of oars. We are in the boats in the middle of the young. Dimly I can see the outline of the shore. And there are no gunboats of the Japanese in sight. And only now, as I hear those friendly Chinese voices calling to each other through the night, I remember that in my haste, I did not even say goodbye or thank you to Tsai. Forgive me, Tsai. Miss Medley. Yes? What would you do if the Japanese should come now? Not that they will come now, but if they should have. I have a pistol. And if I couldn't use that, there is the young tzu to drown in. Here, yeah, isn't this? Oh, look, Miss Smedley. The shore is coming into view. Oh, yes. And then the prow of our boat touches the shore, grinds on the beach. We are safe. And there are people waiting to welcome us to the land of the gorillas. We are safe at last. <laughs> I 
came to the land of guerrillas by boat, and I left for another part of their land by boat. But there, in between the trips over the water, I met a child. His name? Chun Guo Wa. Listen, I shall summon him up out of my memory. Guo Wa! Guo Wa! Yes, Miss Medley. Yes. You wanted something. Something I can get you. A bowl of hot water, a pencil. Take your time, Guo Wa. Get your breath. I'm all right. I'm your orderly, aren't I? I'm supposed to look after you, aren't I? That's why I come when you call. Yes, Guo Wa. But Guo Wa is not here with me. He's still in China with the guerrillas. I hope he is still alive. A thin little boy. I remember when I first saw him, his small, melancholy face looking up into mine. And I'm not tall. The other soldiers call me one of the Shio Kui. Well, that means little devil, doesn't it? Oh, but they do not really mean it that way. It is just a name for us. How old are you, Guo Wa? I am ten. Oh, I am eleven. Maybe I am even nine. No. No, I can't be nine. I am much older than that. I am eleven. Don't you know? No one ever had the time to tell me. My father died a long time ago, and my mother could not count. Nobody else seemed to care. No, Miss Medley, I... I don't know exactly how old I am. Do you mind very much? Mind? No, I don't mind. And he stands there waiting to be sure that I don't really mind. Waiting, looking up at me. Outside in the camp, the cold wind is blowing. I suppose I shivered. Not from the cold of the wind, but of the world. Go wah. Go wah. Yes, Miss Medley. You uh, won't be offended, will you, if I say that uh, you have lice? Oh, yes, of course I have. I have watched lice all my life. If you have few, you must scratch. But if you have many, you don't itch anymore. You have a headache. Do you have headaches, Guo Wa? Oh, yes, many times. But I get over them. I watch everything that happens, Miss Medley. Even lice? Even lice? Maybe I should learn more about them, even. Uh, look, if I get the uh, hot water, will you... Guo Wa, will you let me give you a bath? Will you? I will heat the water myself, and I will bathe myself. Is that permitted? Oh, yes, of course. Only let's do it now. Now. At once, as you wish. At once. And so at last I sat watching the fire tongs get red hot on the charcoal fire, while in a corner of my hut Guo Wa bathed himself in a wooden tub. Look, Miss Medley, how clean I am getting myself. Look! I see. How did you come to be here with the gorillas? Oh, I wanted to be. I was a beggar boy, but I didn't wail and moan or beat my head in the dust. So I didn't make much. But why are you here? You haven't told me. Because I am a poor man and this is a poor man's army. When I heard of this army, I wanted to join it at once. Even if I was little. That was only because I didn't eat enough. And I heard that in this army, everyone learned to read and write. Then I was sure. So, what did you do? I asked a policeman where the gorillas were. He shook me and told me to go home. But I had no home. So I asked and asked. And, and then there was an old man. He told me that if I walked straight north, I'd find the army. And I did. I walked and walked and walked. You're glad that you did? Glad? I wouldn't know anything if I hadn't come here. Although, I still have a lot to learn. A lot to learn? I sit and watch the iron tongs get hot, the metal turning from red slowly to almost white in the heat of the coals. And I think of this boy who trudged toward this army, toward learning, toward freedom. At last, I take the tongs out of the fire. I pick up his little uniform and draw the hot iron tongs down the wet seams. You are killing the lice. Yes. It's clean now. Ready for you to put on. Now I know how to kill lice, really. Miss Medley. Yes, Guo Wa. 
I thank you. You are both father and mother to me. I thank you. And I sat there staring at his little face and the little thin body now buttoned up in the deloused uniform. A long time, it seemed. Before I asked him, Guo Wa, how would you like me to adopt you? Adopt? Yes. Yes, then, then you would go somewhere and really learn, learn about the world. Then you could come back here and teach the others. What do you think of it? I will have to think about it, Miss Medley. Thank you for the bath and the way of killing life. He was gone. And he cared for my wishes all the time I was there in that guerrilla camp. Nothing more was said of the adoption until the day I was to leave. He came in to see me very shy. Miss Medley? Guo Wa? Oh, come in. Please do. Medley, y you said you wished to adopt me. I did. I meant it. I have thought much about it. I, I have talked to the other... Little devils? Yes. Hmm. Well, what did you decide? I think... We all think that all men must remain at the front. You can adopt me after the final victory. But Guo Wa... After the final victory, Miss Medley. Thank you. I last saw him as I sat in the boat that was taking me to another guerrilla camp. He was washing his clothes in the water of the lake with some other boys. He waved to me and called out, Goodbye, Miss Medley! Goodbye! Goodbye, Guo Wa! Goodbye! As we... Pulled away from the shore, he didn't wave anymore. He stood perfectly still, watching the boat that was taking me away. <laughs> the man who is laughing is a guerrilla fighter. His name is Chun Fang Chuen. He's not more than 26. Like the other wounded fighters who are sitting here, he is maimed for life. And the reason he laughs is because I asked him how he was wounded. How it happened that his arm is stiff and his right hand useless. It was very funny how that happened. In our camp one night, it was pouring rain. All of us were feeling miserable. The commander of our detachment came up to look at us. He stood looking at us a long time, and we looked at him before he spoke. The Japanese are going to attack us at daybreak. Ah, oh, that's good. Who spoke? I did. It's good that we're going to be attacked, especially when we know about it. It makes me forget my wet skin. Yes, that is so. And tomorrow the sun will be shining. It will be hot. And for all the sweat he'll have getting here, we'll fool the enemy. When he gets here, tired and hot, he'll find an empty village. But we'll be back, won't we? We'll be back, yes. We'll march round the mountain and be at the enemy's back. <laughs> it sounds all right. All right. So the enemy arrived at daybreak. But the village is empty. We shall march till we find the bandits. So they marched, and they marched, and they marched, and the sun got hotter and hotter, and they marched right back to the village again. And this time, sitting in the middle of the road, was an old man, the only one left in the village. The Japanese officer with a sweat streaming down him. You, old man! Old man, where are the bandits? We have come to save you from the bandits. Where are they? I know all this because we were watching, hidden. Tell me where the bandits are, and I will reward you. What did you say? Where are the bandits? Bandits? I have never seen any. And I am a very old man. I have lived in this village all my life. I remember my father telling me when he was a very old man that his father had once seen bandits. But... And these soldiers! I am afraid the heat has affected you. You are hot and sweaty. And sometimes... 
people see things that aren't there when they're very hot. You should not march so much. It is hard on your soldier. You lie! There are soldiers! Where are they? You lied to me! You lied to me! I will run you through! So, there you lie, don't you? Dead. For all your trouble and sweating. Uh, it was very foolish of you to come here, officer. You only met death. Even though I'm an old man who cannot read or write, an ignorant Chinese, I am alive, and you are dead. Uh, there is a lesson in that, I guess. And I guess you were the fool, Japanese officer. <laughs> it was a very warm welcome and a very polite farewell. And that, Chun, is how you got your wound. Oh, yes, we all make our mistakes. I was caught in crossfire while we were chasing them. It was stupid of me. I, I would know better next time. But now my arm is stiff and my hand is useless. Chun. Yes, Miss Smedley? Now that you can't fight anymore, what would you like to do? You're still very young. Do? I think I would like to work in a transport station. There I might see a lot of people coming and going. And I've not seen nearly as many people as I would like to. And I'd like to learn how to work a radio. Why? So I could hear messages from the whole world. Messages from the whole world. Perhaps now Chun hears them. Wu can't, but perhaps his friend can. And Tsai, to whom I forgot to say goodbye. All the people of China. Messages from the other fighting peoples of the world that say simply, you have fought our battle for us, even when we did not know it was ours. But we know now. And you, people of China, shall not be enslaved. And we say this to you because we have heard the voice of young China. Death, I reject you. Oh, yes, with you I will have nothing to do. Until you come to me, until I welcome you over the slain bodies of the invaders, of my enemies. Death, do you hear me? China and I reject you. As the 16th program of Words at War, we have brought you a radio interpretation of passages from the Battle Hymn of China by Agnes Smedley, a reporter's record of 12 years in China. The Battle Hymn of China was adapted by Kenneth White of the NBC script staff. The role of Agnes Smedley was played by Hester Sondergaard. Starting next week, Words at War will be heard on Tuesday evenings at this time instead of on Thursdays. Next Tuesday, we will present 83 Days by Mark Murphy... The Amazing Story of the Survival of Simonitsi. Words at War is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>